This is Chris. Hi, and by the way, this is Andy. Hi. We're from Frank Taylor Associates. We are. So today, we're going to take you through the... Dun, 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 Oh, that's an interesting one. So these are the dental practice myths. So these are the sorts of things that people, I assume, want to find out the lies, the smoke, the mystery around dental practices. Ooh, sounds exciting. I don't know, let's like Greek let's, myths. Let's tear it off and get started and see what sort of thing Number one myth using. is... Using a dental broker that doesn't charge you, selling for free is a myth. Oh. Interesting. Let me... Uh, there's you, look at that. I'm going to have to read the question myself. Uh, Using a broker that doesn't charge you, selling for free is a myth. Ah, right, right, right. This is the myth that there is no such thing as a free lunch. Yep. So these are the people who sell their dental practice and they are really, really pleased with themselves because they didn't pay a commission to a broker. That's sounding like a good idea at the moment. Uh, it is, it is. But the not so good idea is the only reason they get it for free is because their practice hasn't been sold for the best price. Ah, okay. So, uh, quick example. Someone goes, uh, sell a practice. No, in fact, it's one we've done. Um, uh, a practice sold, valued 1.1 million. Remember 1.1 million? Um, this broker gonna sell it no charge, no charge, all free, sir, all free. Um, solicitor said, go and talk to Chris and Andy. We valued it 1.2 million, so 100 grand, 100 grand. Uh, our commission fee was uh, about 35, something like that. Um, so already sixty-five thousand pound more. Sounding good. And Sounding do you good. remember what we got for it when we put it to market? Was it one point four? It was indeed one point four. So my maths is an extra three hundred grand, and a net of our commission is about two hundred and sixty-five thousand ish. So selling for free, uh -uh, it costs you. It's a myth busted. Myth busted. Hey, so, I like that. Number two. Number two. Means the dental practice myths number two is telling your team at the right time. Ooh, telling your team at the right time. I think telling your team. Telling like, your team I think right that. Time. I think that probably means that. So when you're selling your dental practice, at some point you have to tell your team. Obviously. I think it comes down to timing when you do that. Mm -hmm. I think some people get um, enthusiastic, feel an obligation to tell their yeah. team really early yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The danger is it can disturb people, it can disrupt the situation. And without a doubt, you need to tell them. Yes. However, if you wait until you've exchanged contracts, the deal's in the bag, yeah. you know it's going to happen. And actually, I also think from a, from a fairness point of view, what sounds better? I'm sending my practice. I don't know to who and I don't know when, but don't panic. Or you could say, I'm sending my practice to somebody called Jennifer. She's lovely. She thinks like me. You're going to get to meet yeah. her in the next couple of weeks. She's going to take the practice over and everything's going to work out really well. Option B sounds better. It so does. I think you tell people a bit later and earlier. Yeah, yeah. Because as you say, until exchange happens, it could not happen. Sadly. Right, Sadly. there we go. Uh, number three, my name Number three, the dental practice myth on Google. Number three is giving your team a wage rise part way through the sale process. <laughs> so is that a good idea or not, Chris? Uh, I think the answer is, um, if it's part of your normal annual review, yep. then the answer is you have to do it, otherwise it looks a bit obvious and a bit weird if you have it. Um, I think where this is probably on is the fact, um, do you remember that guy who, 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 who basically, he was he was selling his practice, wasn't he? It was all going very well, and uh, he, he loved his team, been there 20 years, they were great. Um, and he decided, <laughs> he decided as a, a bit of a farewell, that he would give them all a 20% pay rise. <laughs> Um, and the problem with that was um, it affects your profit. And if it affects your profit, it affects your value. Um, so the buyer, guess what, said, I don't want to pay that money. And the seller was rather upset. And the stupid thing is the seller didn't do anything bad. They were trying to look after their yeah. team, they were trying to be nice, trying to be generous, and didn't realise in the round of doing that they were going to muck up their deal. Yeah. Such a shame. What he should have done, what he should have done is given them a bonus. Yeah. He'd have paid the bonus not part of his ongoing yeah. commitment. Yeah. But or yeah. ask questions of the people that he was working with uh -huh. on the sale yeah, yeah, yeah. to kind of say, is it a good idea or not? So that, that's, a, that's a funny old that's question, a, isn't it? It's a good one, though, because some people do it from a good place. Oh, absolutely. But just cock it up. Assuming your landlord will be nice and friendly about a lease extension. Right, so I imagine this is about <laughs> when you're selling your dental practice and you operate from a leasehold, 
you may need to get your lease extended perhaps out to 12 or 15 years so your buyer has a nice long yeah. term to yeah. help them arrange their finance. So you assume that your landlord is a really nice person and they're going to do this without any issues. 20 years I've known you as my man. Yeah, unfortunately, landlords are commercial beings. So if they get a, a sniff yeah. that you might be selling and there might be some money in the pot, it's not unheard of that they decide to ask for a premium for yeah. your lease. I think the worst we saw was a £50,000 premium to get a lease extended. And um, he'd unfortunately let out the fact he was already going on a cruise yeah. to the landlord. Yeah. So the landlord went, want to go on a cruise or pay me 50 grand? Yeah. So the answer is, uh, yeah, I had that question before. <laughs> you think about okay, here we go. And I think this is number five. Number five is giving you back your NHS contract with no income replacement plan. So Great idea. Th this is people effectively saying, I have a business that turns over, say, £500,000, of which £200,000 is in NHS contracts. I don't like working for the NHS anymore. So I'm going to give that £200,000 back. So now I've only got a business that turns over £300,000. Is that, is that a good idea? Uh, no. No, uh, personally, I think the answer is no, uh, because probably you've still got the costs of yep. your £200,000. And probably when, even if you got rid of all the costs, it probably would not make you as profitable. And if you're not as profitable, you're not as valuable. No. Now, it doesn't mean you shouldn't give your NHS contract back. But with a plan. Yeah, with a plan. So those patients that you're treating, you may talk to them about an alternative way of being treated as a patient that might be through one of the plan-based yeah. schemes. So the patients stay with the practice, you preserve that revenue, and then you could give your NHS contract back if that's what you wanted to do, confidently knowing that the patients yeah. are safe inside the practice. And, and probably, enhance your profitability, which well will done. enhance your value. It might take six, nine, 12 months to do the transition, yeah. but no, uh, we don't think that's a wonderfully no. great idea, especially if you're trying to exit. Oh, absolutely. So the myths keep coming. So what's this one? This one is adding an additional surgery when you are only at 50% chair occupancy. So this is, you've got a four surgery practice, mm -hmm. um, your total dental days delivered across dentists, therapists, and hygienists, total together, would only fill two surgeries. If you've got four surgery practice, dentists are being delivered across those four surgeries, but when you clump it all together, it's only effectively two surgeries. Mm. What's the logic in then adding on another surgery, so you've got five surgeries, if you've got effectively two surgeries not being used? So people quite often get carried away with the excitement yeah, and the yeah, thought yeah. of adding in another surgery. Yeah. Until you get your chair occupancy to somewhere 80% plus, in my view, you shouldn't be considering adding in another surgery. No, it means there's been a very convincing equipment salesman <laughs> uh, in your surgery. <laughs> That's what it is. I think there's been that. Um, and I sort of look at it, it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like ordering dessert when you've eaten so much you couldn't even eat, eat yeah. dessert. It's like, what a waste of time. Yeah. Um, and as you say, get up to decent capacity yeah. and then use that surgery. It's not like, what's that film? What's that film with uh, Kevin Costner? I think it's Field of Dreams. Oh yeah, Field of Dreams. It's not like it'll if I build it, they will come. come. Put a fifth surgery, they don't just like, come. <laughs> so if it, don't do it. If you can't, don't build it, they won't come. Do a marketing <laughs> plan, make sure there's capacity. Anyway, moving on. Uh, number, what's that, number seven? I think it's, it's seven, it's, yeah. It's not seven. So dental practice myths, the next one is not using specialists, brokers or solicitors. Um, it's a bad idea, generally. There's people out there in all walks of life who specialise in different things. They've invested time, knowledge, money, learning about that thing, and they've trodden that path before you. So to mm. go to a generalist in whatever you're talking about and hoping that you're gonna get a better yeah. result, yeah. kind of makes no sense. Well, I, I, I think of two instances. Uh, one, if you had a problem with your heart and you went to the GP and they said, I'll tell you what, get up, get up on a couch and I'll have a go. Yeah, uh, you'd go. Well, no, thanks very much. I can't like see a cardiologist, so that you wouldn't use a generalist for that. But also, I think it's that thing, especially on contracts. It's not so much what's in it; it's what's mm -hmm. not in it, isn't yeah. it? And and if your lawyer doesn't know what should be in it, then the other side could not put things in. Does that make sense? Absolutely. A bit confusing, but you no. know the answer is you need someone who can say, ah, oh, that clause should be in here. Yeah. But if they don't know. They don't know the clause should and be in reality, it. if you use a specialist who can do a job more quickly than somebody else, it might not cost you more, any more money anyway. Should be better value, shouldn't it? Should be better value, yeah. 
yeah, you, you, you probably need the job done quicker. So yeah, yeah no, uh, you specialist. Yeah, there we go. Uh, number, yeah, number eight. Number eight of dental practice myths says, being behind with filing your financial accounts. That's bad news. Is it matter? Oh, it's horrible. So, if you get behind on filing, filing your accounts, uh, one, HMRC aren't going to love you, and they're going to fine you, no, really because uh, for a start, you're going to get fined, you're going to get interest charged on any tax that's due. So that's a, that's a, you don't want to get an HMRC to register for, for anything, really. Mm. So that's bad news. The other thing is, if you're going into a, a sale process, um, from a valuation point of view, you want to be using the most up-to-date information yes. available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The buyer is oh, going to want. Bad. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Anyway, no. okay. yep. The buyer is going to want to see that most up-to-date information possible, but the buyer's bank is also going to want to see the most up-to-date mm. information possible. So finding your accounts late is bad for HMRC, for valuation, from selling, yeah. from buy from the buyer, the buyer's bank. There's endless reasons why it's not. I good suppose idea. also it just says, doesn't it? That how organised are you? Yeah. What's your practice truly like? You know, and that due diligence person, if you can't get your accounts done, what other things yeah. haven't you done? It says you're inefficient. Yeah, it says you're, yeah, yeah. So do I want to be paying top yeah. dollar for that or not really? Yeah. Probably not. Look at that. Nine penultimate, number my nine, Number nine dental practice misses only offering your practice to your associate. Well, you can, but probably not a great <laughs> idea. Um, because. because with our experience, we generally find that associates, bless them, um, will not want to pay the market value. Yes. Predominantly because they feel they've helped to build the market value. So um, we sort of say, there's no reason not to sell it to your associate, but for a fair price. Mm -hmm. so, so when we value, for instance, when we value some of dental practice, um, we don't build in the associate discount. No. Anyway, we say this is your practice worth a million quid, whatever it is, and then we say to the, the the seller, if you want to sell it at a discount, say nine hundred, sure. there's something to say. Yeah. I yeah. mean, yeah. anything else to add? I think, I think the only other thing as well is that quite often, if as a principal, you're just talking to the associate. There's no competition, yeah, yeah, yeah. True. and when so there's true. no competition, they drag their heels. It's slow, and quite often people come up and start for three, four, five months where nothing's moved mm. on. Because the associate, they notice they're not in competition with them, else they can move at the pace they want. So you can, but it's worth taking those points on board. And on that, make and pay a deposit. Yes. Make and pay a deposit. Yeah. Commitment, skin in the game. Otherwise, I've got nothing to lose. Here we go. This is it. Number two. The last one. So this is the last question that came up on Google of dental practice myths, which is exclusive dealing with someone who sent you a flyer. Exclusive. Okay, so this sounds like as a dental practice owner, um, you will be getting letters, flyers, approaches all the time. Ah, daily, so you're daily. Yeah. Oh. And so this is effectively saying, is it a good idea to deal with a person that puts a flyer through your door? You should talk to them, you mm -hmm. should engage with them, but it's a little bit like in, if your house, imagine you, you're, you're living comfortable in your house, it's, it's in the evening, you're, you're watching Netflix, relaxing, it's all good. Somebody, oh. somebody knocks on your door. Are you drinking somebody, the gin and tonic? Exactly, somebody, oh, somebody knocks on your door. In your case, you do the ring and you go, bing, no, 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 right see it. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm impressed. Yeah. So somebody knocks on the door, and then that person says, I really like your house. Um, can I buy your house? Most people wouldn't, at that point, go, yeah, that's a really good idea, because that person is the only person you talk and to. And surely you don't know what's worth. So the flyer, it's not a bad idea, but you've got to consult a bit more widely. You've got to find out what it's worth for, for you and see if there's anybody else out there that also might be interested in your practice. And, and I think the worth of it is independently, yes. isn't it? It's not like, ask them what they think it's worth. Yeah. And guess what? Uh, might be undervalued. Could well be. Brilliant, there we go. There Top we go. 10 Top dental 10 practice, practice myths. myths.